So far in our Python tutorials, we have learned about carrying out computations with variables and how we can store large data sets in arrays. You're probably wondering by now, what do we actually do with all these numbers? Because it's not very insightful or engaging to just have Python print out a list of numbers for you. I mean, it's one of those things where, yes, you have the information, but can you really use the information? That is what graphing is for. If you think back to when you first learned to use a graphing calculator and you were able to create the graph of any function you wanted, that is what we're going to learn about today, how to graph our data in Python. And this is even better than a, a graphing calculator because the graphing calculator, remember you had to put in the function. Maybe with, uh, in, in Python, maybe you want to graph uh, some experimental data or maybe you want to graph the results of some very laborious computations that wouldn't fit inside of a graphing calculator and that doesn't make a nice neat function. That's what we're going to learn about how to do today. Uh, the most important thing you need is what's called the plot command. Plot lives inside the matplotlib library. Um, you remember last time we learned about the numpy library and how we had to import that to get access to our arrays and various mathematical functions. We're still going to be using that because we still need arrays, but now we're adding an additional library called matplotlib. Matplotlib is one of the most useful and versatile and widely used uh, libraries in Python. You would do well to spend some time becoming comfortable with the basics of matplotlib and learning how to navigate their documentation because if you do anything with any sort of computation in Python, you're going to be using matplotlib at some point. It's kind of the de facto means of creating graphs, which we do a lot of in the sciences and engineering, right? So matplotlib has a whole suite of libraries, so we're particularly looking for the PyPlot, Python plotting library. So we're taking matplotlib.pyplot, we're importing it, right? So we're telling Python, go out to the internet, find me matplotlib.pyplot, and bring it into this program. And we're going to give it the abbreviation PLT, because this is a mouthful, right? This is a lot to type every time, so we're just going to call it PLT. That's the common shorthand for, for PyPlot. The next line is a technical requirement since we're working here in Jupyter Notebook. If you're doing this in a standalone Python environment, I don't think that you need this piece. Uh, this is just telling Jupyter Notebook that you want the graph to actually show up in the output as opposed to out in the computational ether somewhere. Um, there's not really anything for you to do with this line. Just make sure you have it every time you import matplotlib. Just a thing you have to do. You don't need to change it or worry about it. So let's get some data, right? In order to make a graph, I have to have data. I have to tell Python what it is I'm interested in graphing. And you do that with arrays. This is why we went over arrays before we went over graphing, because you need arrays in order to create graphs. So the idea of, of creating a graph here is that I need two arrays. I need an array of values for my horizontal axis and I need a an array of values for my vertical axis, right? It's just like if you're recording data in Excel, you need two columns, right? You need a column of the independent variable and a column of the dependent variable. You grab all that data, you say insert, chart, and hopefully it gives you the right graph. Sometimes it, it, it does not read in your data appropriately. So I need that same setup here. I need an array for the x-axis and I need an array for the y-axis. So for my array for the x-axis, I'm going to use LinSpace. Hopefully you've finished tutorial two and practiced a little bit with LinSpace. But the idea of LinSpace is you give it a starting value, a stopping value, and how many data points you want. Our general rule in physics is that the more data points, the better, because that's going to make generally a smoother looking graph. But it's also going to take longer, right? If you're having Python process millions of data points, it might be a while before it finishes, right? Because a million pieces take a long time to put together. Uh, but once you have that array, 100 data points is fine for this demonstration. Once you have that array, we can use uh, that array to produce a new array. Remember, we learned last time that if you pass this array x into a function, you will get out a new array uh, as a result of that function. So we're going to take e to the negative x squared, one of our favorite functions in physics, the Gaussian uh, decay curve that starts out at 1, dies off to plus and minus infinity. We're going to call that y. So I have an array stored as x, and I have an array stored as y. 
now we get to graph it, right? Because the calculation part is over. Now we use the matplotlib uh, functions to uh, create this graph. <clears throat> this requires a couple of steps. First, we have to actually create the figure, meaning we have to create the visual physical space that the plot is going to occupy. We do that with the subplots command. You really don't need to do anything different with this. There are some arguments you can place in the function. Uh, if you end up needing those, you can Google matplotlib subplots and you can find out everything you need to know about that. But the important thing is this is the thing that creates the figure and actually creates two pieces, right? It creates the figure itself. We're going to call that my figure and it creates my plot. That's the actual plotting graphical environment that's going on. We are more interested in my plot. You can do stuff with my figure to change like the size, the, the, the labels, etc. But the most important thing we're interested in is this by plot because that's the, that's where the actual plot lives. So again, kind of like the percent mat plot lib inline, just copy this line into all of your codes, change the names if you need to, uh, but you really don't have to do anything with that to change it. The most important thing here is where we actually plot. And this is really the only thing you need to create a plot. You really just need the plot command because mat plot lib it takes care of everything else. It takes care of setting up your axis labels. Uh, it takes care of setting up your scale so that you can see the data. You literally just go to uh, the name of your plot, right? Our, the name of our plot is my plot. Dot plot, that's the plot command. I know I'm saying the word plot a lot. Uh, X comma Y. And you just say your, your horizontal data and comma your vertical data. Again, there's other options that can go in here, but we're going to build those out later. When you do that, it's going to create a nice simple graph for you. So we got a graph here in 14 lines. Not bad. Uh, here is my graph. It looks like a Gaussian curve, which is great. Nice to know that it's working. But like I said, it automatically takes care of your axis labels. It automatically scales the window. So if you just need a quick graph to look at data, to, to, to take this, copy and paste it uh, into an email to your advisor, this is fine. This is bare bones all you need. Now, you know from looking at graphs in lab that you do technically need more than this, right? You need actual titles for your axis, right? What are you graphing? Uh, it's proper to have a title. It's proper to have a legend. Sometimes you want to add extra tick marks. Sometimes you want to add some text to it. There are ways of doing that, but this is the basic. This is the very basic way of getting out a graph. By the way, this is actually a, a pretty neat environment when you're working in Jupyter Notebook because this is an embedded image in the web page. So you can right click on this. Click on copy image if you want to copy and paste it into a Word document. You can click on save image as if you want to save this image locally. It's really easy to get this graph image off separated from the Jupyter Notebook. So if you just need the graph, you can get it into a PowerPoint presentation really easily, which is nice. Uh, so let's see. So the checkpoint here asks you to uh, play around with this a little bit. It's asking you to create another plot, right? So you'll have a, a graph of Y and then you'll have a graph of Z. So these are both going to go on the same window. If you just add a second myplot.plot .plot command, uh, you can create a graph of Z versus X right on top of the graph of Y versus X. Uh, the trick is don't create a new figure. Right. If you're if you're wanting two plots, two traces to go onto the same graph, to go onto the same graphing window, just don't call subplots again. Just repeat this part here on line 14. Do not repeat this part here on line 11. Should be pretty straightforward. But then there are more graphing commands. There are lots of options in matplotlib. Let me put it this way. I have to look up the options for matplotlib because there's a lot of them out there. I don't remember what they're all called and they are there for you to, to look up and, uh, and learn how to use. Um, so what the way it usually works, for example, is that you create the plot and then you make additions to it. So you might say myplot.plot x comma y and then on another line, you might add the let the legend. Then the next line you can add the axis title. And then on the next line you can set the horizontal range. And so you just keep incrementally changing stuff about the graph until it looks the way you want, right? It's it's programming. You get unlimited tries. And so you can keep trying until it looks like the thing that you want. So I'm asking you to particularly take a look at the set and legend commands. Um, the way you would type those up would be uh, you would say myplot.set and myplot.legend. If you conduct an internet search for matplotlib set and matplotlib legend, 
You'll find all the documentation, everything you need to know about them. What I'm challenging you to do, this is your checkpoint here, is to play around with those options and figure out what do you need to do to create this graph. So a few things to notice, there are two traces on here, two plots, a blue one and a gold one. Uh, this gold data is the, uh, is the data from this Z function up here. Uh, so you should already have that there on the window. Um, you'll notice that I've added a legend so we can tell Y and Z apart. So look up how to create a legend. Uh, you'll notice it's got a title and two axis labels. So learn how to set the title and the two axis labels there and uh, that will be a nice introduction for this graph for you. Now I want to emphasize that in making this graph here we already knew what the data was. We figured out our data in arrays and, uh, and, and it all just kind of happened at once. But what if you need to uh, figure out the data as you go? This is the way it will usually work in some kind of simulation or computation or something where you are figuring out one data point at a time and then you need to add that data point to the array. NumPy gives you an option to do this using the np.empty function here. What np.empty does is it creates an array. It is a full-sized array with all the features that you need, but its elements are empty. They, they don't have any values in there. So for example, let's suppose we wanted to calculate square root of x here, right? And we wanted to store our progressive estimates of the square root of two. So for example, we want the bare bones version, the first term, then we want the second term, then we want the third term, and we're combining all those together in square root of x, and we want to store each of those square root of x values in, a, in an array. So we're going to call that array square root estimates here. You notice I'm setting each of these values one at a time. I'm setting index one, index zero, index one, index two. Well, I can do that if I set up square root estimates ahead of time. The way you can do that is with the empty function. Literally, you just call np.empty, and then you give it this value here. I'm going to let you figure out what that does by printing that value, but let's just say if you change it to two, you're gonna have a bad time. You can, you can try that out. And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna plot the, uh, the number of terms we're including and the square root estimates, right? So this is how many terms did you include? Well, we included one, two, three. Uh, and then what was your estimate for the square root of two? Well, it was one, then it was 1.5, then it was 1.3. 375, I think it was. So the idea is that this graph, if you keep going, should converge on the square root of 2, the 1.414, 1 etc. But what I've done here is I don't I didn't have all those values when I set up square root estimates. I made that an empty uh, uh, array there. This is like in Excel, when you first open a nice brand new spreadsheet, all those cells are empty and you add the values in maybe one at a time. That's what we're doing down here. We're adding them one at a time. So there's a checkpoint here uh, that just asks you to explore this a little bit. What does square root estimates look like when it first starts out? Um, uh, what would you need to do if you wanted to add the next term? Hint, think carefully about how you need to set up the array initially so that you have a spot to add the third estimate. Uh, and then it'll ask you to change the graph a little bit uh, so that you subtract off the the actual value square root of two so you can show me the error, the actual difference between your estimate and the value of square root of two. Biggest issue I have when I go to create a graph uh, with Matplotlib is that I uh, accidentally try to graph arrays of different sizes. So like for example, this array has 10 elements, this array has eight elements. If you try to graph one against the other, uh, you get a lot of error message here, right? And so I'll ask you to sift through that error message. Where does it actually tell you what the problem is, right? Because all of this gobbledygook that's buried in the Matplotlib library, I don't know how to read that. And like, like I, don't, I don't know what the context is for that. So where does it actually tell you that you have a mistake in the mismatched size there. So I'll ask you to, to, to look for that error. And then finally, we're gonna come back to your project here, your ongoing project to study gravitational potential energy. In Python tutorial two, you created an array 
uh, of values for R and an array of values for U, the gravitational potential energy between two objects. Here what you're going to do is take those two arrays, so copy and paste your cell from tutorial two, and I want you to create a graph of U versus R, and that will be a nice little test of what have you learned so far uh, about making graphs uh, using Matplotlib.